Good morning and welcome to the Foresight Solar Fund Limited full year results investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted any time by the Q&A tab. Situated in the right hand corner of your screen, just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all the questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Ross Driver, Managing Director. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks very much, and thanks for the handover. I guess we can crack on with the presentation to take a run through the full year results. Um, so just go to the first slide there. Um, you've got with me this morning, I've got Toby Berno from the uh, fund management team who uh, works alongside me on that, and Matthias Fierro from our uh, investor relations manager as well. Uh, we'll take you through this pack between us. Um, so just a very quick overview, uh, potentially for those of you who are new to Foresight Group. Foresight Group is an international alternatives manager with uh, about just under uh, 12.5 billion of AUM currently. Uh, the majority of that, just under 10 billion, is within infrastructure. And the most relevant uh, parts for this, uh, for our fund for Foresight Solar, is our international presence there with offices in London, Madrid, Rome, and over both uh, Sydney and Australia, uh, Sydney and Melbourne in Australia. We have 175 infrastructure professionals uh, that works with us uh, across those regions, and we manage over 435 infrastructure assets across 16 different uh, investment vehicles. Uh, if we get on to um, a bit of an overview and recap of Foresight Solar and the fund itself, um, it is remains a predominantly UK focused fund with a, a large portfolio of rock backed UK solar assets. That is the bulk of our portfolio with 50 projects there and 723 megawatts, making it one of the largest portfolios in the in the market. Um, we also have uh, three veg pro bez, uh, battery storage projects, one that's currently in construction and the project rights to two further ones. We then also have our international exposure. Um, we, the fund went into investing in Australia. First of all, we've got four assets there, comprising 170 megawatts of uh, generation. And uh, more recently into Spain, where we developed four projects there and also have uh, and recently made a 50% sell down in the stakes of three of those assets known as the Lorca portfolio above NAV. It is also the region, uh, a core market for us, where we've also done our first development stage investment with just under half a gigawatt of pipeline there that we will we will talk you through in more detail. Yeah, to the next slide. Um, the first slide here is just giving a uh, overview of uh, what we're going to talk through this morning. Uh, predominantly, up the key focus for us and the board has been the capital allocation uh, of the fund and keeping it uh, very tight. In the, uh, in the current time frame. So what have we done? We'll go through in a bit more detail. It's the share buybacks, uh, relatively one of the largest in the uh, renewables market with uh, 40 million committed there. We've made our first investment with the sale of the Lorca portfolio at a 21% premium to NAV. Um, and we've used that uh, alongside of cash generation to pay down the debt. But we'll also focus on that we are not progressing with significant capital expenditure at the moment and paused other construction projects. But we do see scope for modest investment in, um, in development stage pipelines in order to grow the fund in the future. Operational performance um, over strongest year or highest generation uh, to date at over one terawatt hour. Um, the portfolio is not without some challenges that we'll come on to speak about, but it continues to be incredibly strong and incredibly cash generative overall. The financial outlook then, a very strongly covered dividend for 2023, 1.6 times cash covered. And that, along with what we'll talk about, power prices going forward, is what's given ourselves and the board the confidence uh, to increase the dividend target 6% again this year to 8 pence per share. Uh, one of the other uh, uh, parts that we'll come on to speak about, we've got the valuation number up there. We've put out a comparable number to recent transactions in the market. Uh, we see our valuation as uh, somewhat more conservatively valued than some of those transactions at 1.17 million pounds per megawatt there. So if we can go on to the next slide, just diving in a little bit more detail on the, um, the capital allocation 
and the rationale behind that. Um, the share buyback program, why are we doing that? Well, we see it in terms of it's a good way to acquire an investment decision on its own, which is acquiring stock in our own portfolio that we believe is incredibly solid and is massively undervalued at the moment. And we believe that that has been borne out by the recent transactions in the market that we'll come on to. And it's also a good way to return cash to shareholders. We would say that we have done this. Others have talked about it and not done as much. And arguably, this is the, uh, like we say, the largest relative buyback program in the market. And it is NAV accretive in terms of on a pens per share basis that we'll come on to. We are, we made the first, as mentioned, um, first part of our um, investment program with the sale of Walker, circa 50 megawatts there. Um, we're not intending to rest on our laurels with that. We are looking to push ahead with the remainder of that investment program during 2024. Um, we're not putting ourselves to a mast and saying specifically which assets they are. We're looking to retain a bit of flexibility on that, but we are making progress on all fronts and hope to report back on that before too long as well in terms of progress. The, the key area of what we've used monies from the sales for is to pay down the RCF balance. So the only variable rate debt that the portfolio currently has, and it's, it's just over 6% at the moment in terms of that. So it's a key area to focus on to reduce. We gave ourselves the target of paying that down to 75 million by the end of December. And we hit that by making 40 million of reductions in the RCF drawings from the sale of Lorca but also from cash generation of the fund as well. We'd also say on top of that, we've also paid 42 million of our long-term amortizing debt. So in, in total, 82 million was paid off the uh, paid off debt by the company. We've also extended out the RCF as well to 2026, deferring any refinance and risk there, but still see a very strong market from other funds that we manage and the interest in RCFs for these funds. Um, on the dividend increase, just coming back to that, yeah, it's a, another 6% increase, taking us to 8 pence per share. Um, we'll go on to why we feel comfortable giving this. We see it as a bit of a catch up for the last couple of years of high inflation and high power prices and looking to pass some of that on to investors. Um, but based on the current NAV, that's just under a 7% uh, yield on that and around probably closer to 9% uh, yield based on the current share price as, as of today. And we, current, we continue to uh, con continue with our strong shareholder engagement, continuing to broaden the investment base, having many, many meetings and discussions with investors to get feedback. There can be a diverse range of views around what's best to do at the moment, but we hope in terms of our, our strategy here, we are looking to cover off as many things that we think are in shareholders' interests uh, as some of the feedback that we're getting and we believe is the right thing to do. Um, we've also done a shareholder perception study recently that's uh, had some very good insights into that for us. Um, I'll just hand over to Toby for the next slide to take through a little bit more of that in a diagrammatic form of capital allocation. Well. Thank you, Ross. Um, so on this slide, we aim to illustrate the company's uh, capital allocation policy. Um, we presented a similar diagram to this, clearly communicate the strategy to the market at the interim results. And what we do now is evidence what we actually delivered in the period in terms of capital allocation. So moving from left to right, you can see we started the year with some healthy cash balances and then went on to generate record levels of cash in the period, 120 million, uh, over 120 million gross proceeds, um, net of debt service uh, and amortization, um, 71 million was received by the company, um, in addition to 24 million of proceeds from the sale of that 50% stake in Lorca at 21% premium to the holding value of that asset. Um, we then utilise that cash, um, uh, carefully balancing it across a number of different capital allocations. Um, first and foremost, servicing our dividend, uh, which is paid in full and in line with target, as we have done every year for the 10 years since IPO. Uh, Ross has already touched on uh, paying down the RCF. We set ourselves a target of reducing this balance to 75 million by the end of the year, and that was a target that we hit, paying down 40 million of that balance. We are halfway through the share buyback program as of the end of the period, with 20 million having been invested um, out of the total 40 million budget that increased fourfold throughout the year. Um, and finally, I'll touch on reinvestment in the pipeline and portfolio itself. Um, we have 11 million that went into uh, reinvestment in the portfolio. Some of that, uh, the bulk of it, were pre existing contractual commitments. 
to further the construction of our first battery storage project, the Sandridge project in Wiltshire that will connect later this year. Um, and then the balance was invested in the acquisition of a 467 megawatt pipeline of Spanish development stage solar assets. Um, and we're very excited to be um, uh, taking that first step uh, investing in development stage projects, and that is shaping some of the future investment strategy for the fund that we'll come on to later in the presentation. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so in this section, uh, we recap on the net asset value um, that was announced earlier in the period. Uh, we present here an abridged version of the, the NAV bridge um, for the year, focusing on the key value drivers across the period. Um, so there's overall a fall in net asset value uh, to a little over 118 pence per share. Um, the primary driver uh, on that downward pressure on NAV um, was the increase in discount rates, um, just shy of 100 basis points increase over the period, bringing the weighted average discount rate for the fund uh, to a little over 8%, the highest in its history uh, since IPO. That is naturally a, a reaction to increasing uh, risk-free rates uh, in the countries which we operate in around the world. There are also downward pressures from macro assumptions going forward, uh, principally power price uh, outlook uh, and also inflation, um, both seeing uh, modest uh, downward pressure. Um, in the case of power price forecasts, this was offset um, by reduced tax um, versus that budgeted under the electricity generation levy, uh, which was introduced um, during the energy crisis of 2022. Um, going forward, we do not forecast to make any further payments uh, under the electricity generator levy owing to the reducing power price outlook and also the allowance that's afforded under that regime. Um, finally, project actuals uh, for the period came slightly below budget, and that's again as a function of prices actually secured, um, where we, uh, we had projects that did not have hedges in place being below those that were originally budgeted. Moving to the right of the chart, we can see the positive levers that we've been pulling uh, to drive value for the company and for its shareholders. Firstly, the share buyback program, uh, the 20 million invested in our own stock, um, was now accretive to the tune of 1.1 pence per share. Um, we also then crystallized uh, value through the sale of the law asset, both cash um, proceeds received, but also marking up our residual stake in that portfolio, accreting 1.6 pence per share for our shareholders. And then finally, in that other bar, that's comprised of uh, a markup of Rigo's pricing outlook. Those are the certificates that accompany um, every megawatt tower of renewable electricity generated in the UK reflecting actual contracts that we've secured in our portfolio team for our assets. Um, and then finally, the ongoing campaign to extend asset lives for our portfolio. We can move on to the next. Just, oh, sorry, yeah. I'm just, you can see the question there about the buybacks as well. Uh, I think it's a, it's a fair question in terms of, uh, does it make sense to continue buying back? The average purchase for last year was 96 pence, we're currently at 89. Um, what we just say to that is, Tom, we'll go through this on the next slide in terms of, of what we see as proof of valuations. And actually, I think there's an argument to buy even more of our shares back at the current uh, share price because we still see it as massively undervalued versus what the value of our assets, particularly in the UK, Spain and Australia, are actually worth. Um, it's, it's always a good argument in terms of how much of a difference it makes on an ongoing basis. But I think you always see there's been a bit of a, a, a small jump in uh, in the in the share prices across the markets this moment, this morning, literally just off the news that inflation is coming a bit lower. That feeds into views on when interest rates may be cut. We feel that we're doing everything we can here with the levers that we can pull. We do see our fair value of being well in excess of 100, closer to like 118 pence at the moment. So we do see this as a significant discount to the fair value of the assets. We do intend to continue to keep buying the stock even at these reduced prices. I think as soon as there's an indication from the Bank of England that uh, rates are gonna come down, you will see a re-rating in this sector. And that's why we continue to see it as a good investment. But yeah. Toby will talk through how we see that in terms of the the, uh, the comparable transactions out there. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, the opportunity to invest in a stable operational portfolio with a 10 year um, production track record um, at the implied returns um, that our current share price offers um, it, it is a great investment by all accounts, um, and you know that is the, the primary driver to the buyback program. Um, we would reiterate that it is in balance with tightening up the balance sheet um, through paying down variable uh, interest rate debt, um, and also investing in the future um, growth of the pipeline that will come on to a bit later on uh, when we go through um, case study for our development assets in Spain. 
Um, on this slide that we're showing now, we present uh, for the first time um, the split out of our UK portfolio valuation, um, the enterprise value on a pound per megawatt basis at 1.17 million pounds per megawatt. We think it's a, an appropriate time to be disclosing this level of detail in our valuation, as quite rightly, portfolio valuations are under scrutiny in the market um, uh, against uh, rising risk-free rates and high inflationary backdrop. Um, what we do then is present this against a number of publicly available comparables. And we think that the three we've selected here are particularly relevant um, uh, in the market for UK rock back solar assets. Um, in each case, these portfolios have very similar vintages uh, in terms of rock accreditation and subsidy um, support relative to XFL's own portfolio. Um, and in each case, um, we have some greater insight into the Foresight BCT sale where that was managed uh, in-house by Foresight Group. Uh, so we know just how far in excess of 100 million that did trade. But otherwise, in each case, all of those portfolio valuations are in excess of our own uh, portfolio valuation and at every stage uh, throughout the last year that we present above. Um, what we think this does overall is hopefully provide confidence to the market in the robustness of our valuation methodology um, and give confidence that at least the cutting edge of the market is more aggressive than our own valuations. We do obviously have insight as to the range of bids that were received in a number of these processes. Um, and we are very comfortable with the level of our valuation relative to uh, the range of bids received. We we'll move on to the next slide, please, Mateus. Uh, we'll now move on to operational performance. I'll hand back over to Ross uh, to uh, talk through uh, results from the year. Yeah, so what the chart is showing here is the ongoing uh, uh, growth in the total generation of the portfolio that's hit over one terawatt this year, predominantly with Spain coming online. What I point to is you see there, there's a sort of dark gray bar being the UK generation. So once that portfolio was built up from about 2018, that generation has been pretty stable there. In fact, the major fluctuation is down to irradiance and as generating more when irradiation has been above budget. Because those, I think we just say, we are confident that our portfolio is one of the best performing in the market, given the asset management team and their work to keep that portfolio operating and online in order to capture the additional days of sunshine out there when we, we, are, we have very limited downtime on that portfolio given their proactive asset management, and it's been very solid for a long time. The gold bar uh, is the generation that's coming through Australia, which itself has been pretty consistent, and it's fair to say that market has not been without its issues. We have a 9% below forecast for this year. It has been below forecast for the last couple of years. Um, it has uh, been impacted by high economic curtailment, which means that plants are ramped down at periods of oversupply into the markets. They still have a lot of coal there that is still yet to be ramped down, and a lot of baseload uh, production. It's something that the governments are looking to address there and is key focus for us this year in terms of looking to rectify that. We are looking at modest sort of asset management spend to either put batteries on those uh, projects to take off some of this generation during times of uh, curtailment, or even private wire connections to sell some of this electricity direct to other, other users to help alleviate some of this. It is something that's expected to alleviate from the market in general going forward, but uh, looking at the Australian portfolio and how best uh, we resolve those issues is a key focus for us this year. Uh, and then just going on to Spain, we've been very happy with the Spanish portfolio coming on for its first year, full year of generation there. And um, it was just 1.5% below budget, but that was really because the radiation was 1.6, how strong, how much sunshine we were getting is 1.6 below forecasts uh, due to it being quite stormy earlier in the year in southern Spain. So Spain otherwise is, is on budget and on target. Um, just going on to the next slide. Um, I think it's moved before that. Oh, uh, no. Ooh, no. Okay. So we've been, um, in terms of the uh, one of the questions we've had quite a bit around is power price forecasts and um, and our hedging position as well. We are very well hedged on the portfolio for the next couple of years for uh, this year and for next with around uh, on average around over 80% of our revenues either through from subsidies or through the uh, price fixes actually covering that. The question is, what happens to power prices? Uh, a lot of people are pretty well fixed over the next few years in the immediate term. What happens longer term in this, and particularly over from 2026 onwards? 
So a number of the analysts covering the market have, have raised this question, sort of rightly so, and showing there that the chart on the top left is the uh, Bloomberg forward curve in terms of um, what, what's happened to the forward rate prices in the market over the next few years, showing that those have come down uh, significantly. Uh, we agree that's something that we've seen in the markets as well. This is the off takers that we sell our energy to and what prices we can achieve for that. And we'd also agree that with certain off takers, the uh, liquidity is noticeably lower and has dropped off as well. And what we would say is that we put that chart there on the right to show the sort of range of prices that we're seeing in the market and have the ability to lock into for the rest of this decade. We still have very strong dividend cover of, um, we're forecasting one and a half times for 25, uh, 1.35 times for 26. But then we're saying actually in the broader pool of uh, hedge counterparties and other off takers that we see, this pricing that we're seeing on the right hand side remains attractive in terms of um, in terms of what we can lock into. There's a, a lower band being the black line there and the upper band being the blue line. In terms of even at the middle point of that around the 60 pounds per megawatt hour, we are comfortable at being able to lock into that and providing strong dividend cover for the foreseeable future of, from which we're talking in excess of, well, in excess of one times. I think we've been a bit spoiled with the power prices in recent years, uh, but given the consistency of solar production, I think a target dividend cover of 1.1 to 1.2 times is a very healthy target. Um, that has given us and the board uh, with careful consideration about dividend cover when setting targets. We forecast uh, dividend cover of what we think we will be giving in a continued uh, progressive increase year on year. We forecast it out for the long term and to give ourselves the comfort that we're able to cover that with our electricity sales. Um, looking at that analysis has given us the confidence to, again, give that 6% uplift on the dividend for the year 2024. And we remain confident of robust dividend cover going forward for the foreseeable future, which we will give further updates on as we build out that hedge position. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sure thing. So um, we'll cover sustainability performance in the period on this slide, um, touching briefly on some of the key achievements in the year. Um, as Ross has already mentioned in the operational performance, this is the first year that the fund uh, or funds portfolio has generated over a terawatt hour globally. Um, and that's a great milestone uh, for the fund um, as it's, you know, uh, full solar capacity um, has come online. And we clearly hope to add that, um, bringing through that solar development pipeline going forwards. Just to put that uh, one terawatt hour into context in a more meaningful way, that's over 400,000 uh, UK households at annual consumption um, or the total electricity uh, consumption for businesses and households in the city of Hull. Um, so a very substantial contribution um, to decarbonisation of energy production, um, you know, that the funders are rightly proudly making. Um, further initiatives that we'd like to touch on on this slide um, are a, a new initiative to boost um, biodiversity net gain across our projects, working with um, uh, consultants and contractors to look at what we can do um, to support wildlife uh, in and around our projects um, and positively contribute to biodiversity um, where these were you know, previously farmers' fields uh, with relatively poor biodiversity. Uh, and then finally, the sustainability-linked RCF um, has been extended in its term uh, by a further year. Um, this continues to be linked to um, KPIs uh, that the fund can deliver on to uh, be incentivized to uh, receive reduced levels of interest. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay. I think that the, this, this slide here is one that we possibly skipped over earlier. Um, we'll dwell on it just quickly um, as it just illustrates the hedge position for the company over the coming years, giving that high comfort around visibility of dividend cover and prices that we can secure um, both in 2024 and 2025, underpinning that strong dividend cover guidance of 1.5 times for 2024 and 1.35 uh, for 2025. Um, and as Ross mentioned earlier, we have good visibility uh, over continued dividend cover into the foreseeable future. We have skipped to the next slide now. Um, this is a slide covering the gearing position um, of the company. Um, at the head of the presentation, Ross uh, reiterated our commitment to paying down um, our floating rate debt um, in the form of uh, the RCF. Um, and that was part of uh, the overall reduction um, in our total debt balance of 82 million uh, over the year. That's a 16% reduction um, in borrowings uh, versus the start of the period. 
and bringing total gearing for the portfolio down to 38.8% of GAV. We remain very committed uh, to prioritise paying down the RCF, um, which had an interest rate cost of uh, almost 6.5% in 2023, and clearly um, it is a higher cost than um, you know, we would like. So we are focusing on paying that down, and that will primarily be funded down to further disposals of our 200 megawatt investment programme, as well as um, uh, cash flows generated organically uh, by the portfolio. The final thing that I'll just reiterate on this slide is that our long-term debt um, is sized against the subsidies and contracted revenues um, that uh, our assets benefit, benefit from in the portfolio. Um, it is fully amortising and fully hedged against interest rate movements. And we believe that as a uh, level of structural financial gearing um, is at a, an appropriate and conservative level, um, particularly relative to um, others in the peer group. Um, moving on to outlook um, and the strategic direction for the fund going forwards. And we start with a case study um, of Foresight Solar's investment in the Lorca project in Spain. Now, the Lorca project is in fact three assets um, in a 99 megawatt portfolio, and those were acquired in 2020, leveraging the local connections of Foresight Group's Madrid office. They secured those project rights at the pre construction stage from, uh, on a bilateral basis with an experienced local developer. They then went on to structure the construction agreements, the financing agreements, and the offtake, securing a 10 year fixed price PPA. Uh, with a credit worthy uh, counterparty, Stackraft, uh, biggest um, uh, energy house in Europe, uh, adding value every step of the way. Over the course of the next 18 months, the project was constructed, reaching commercial operations in August 2022, at which point we wrote up the value of the asset um, by 17% to 1.9 pence per share. Um, that's illustrative of the value add um, through de risking the project by taking it all the way through construction bringing into stable operations. We fast forward now to the end of 2023 um, and the successful delivery of the first phase of our investment program, we sold down a 50% stake in the Lorca portfolio for a 21% premium uh, to its holding value, um, generating 1.6 pence per share of NAV output for our shareholders. Um, overall, we're, we're amazingly pleased with this result um, and we think this is a great illustration of how through systematically bringing a project through its key life cycle milestones and de-risking it, you can broaden the appeal um, and bring in investors, um, as is the case here, a purely financial investor with a you know, low cost of capital who is very happy to come in alongside a specialist investment manager such as Foresight um, to co-own an asset that we know well and continue to manage in full um, and crystallise that value for shareholders. Now, we think that this case study is illustrative um, uh, of what we have achieved um, in terms of bringing projects through development all the way through to operations. And this is something that we would like to emulate and repeat again going forwards as we look at our development stage investments. And if Matthias, you wouldn't mind uh, flipping to the next slide, I'll hand over to Ross to talk through our first step um, uh, into development stage investments with the 467 megawatt portfolio in Spain, and then how we hope to build on this um, as we pursue this strategy further. Yes, Tommy. So the reason for going through the Walker example there was not just to talk about the investment made part of the first part of that but also to give a steer for we see part of the strategy for the fund going forward as being more of a training strategy and more of a recycling of capital not just the initial 200 megawatts that we've talked about there so the first uh, step in our investments into development stage portfolios was uh, this uh, 467 megawatt uh, pipeline of spanish solar that's across six projects, the first of which around a sort of 60 megawatt site in southern Spain could come through and get consented later this year. What that would mean for us is we would actually have be in that project from an earlier stage than even the Lorca assets that we sold there and have an additional ability to take value from that. To give um, investors an idea, the, the investment to secure that pipeline up front was in the single low digit million euros with 85% of the payments made to the developer only at the point at which that gets planning consent and becomes an RTB or ready to build asset. We know from the price that is pre-agreed there, we could already sell those rights immediately out into the market without doing anything else, around two to two and a half times uh, the, the cost that we will have paid for them. Alternatively, we can take them forward and by going into that asset at an earlier stage, we know it will give us very high 
single digit returns, almost double digit returns, uh, taking it forward to build it out and construct it. And therefore it is a very, uh, we see it as very yield accretive to the fund as well. Of course, if assuming that markets really haven't still recovered at that point, at the point that this project comes out, it will be following our capital allocation program, which may mean that although it looks like a great opportunity, we may be passing on this one and selling it on to uh, cash in, and that money then flows back into the decision-making process. But we see that as indicative of a pipeline that we're looking to build here. It sounds like a lot we're targeting two to three gigawatts. So about, yeah, whether well, that's four to, uh, I believe four to six or seven times the size of that at the moment, but we don't see that as actually being that much. When you say small single digit millions in order to secure these kind of rights, what we're looking at in the funds discussions at the moment on is sort of UK pipelines of solar, um, some co-location, some bears in there as well, in order to take through and build through developments. Uh, and would look to bid development stage UK solar projects into the CFDs and other subsidies that can long term become a replacement for the rocks in the portfolio. We're looking at more solar across Europe in other markets as well, potentially more in Spain, some Germany, other markets there. And also looking at there are some interesting opportunities in battery storage at the moment to get in early stage in other markets, including Spain and potentially Italy, where there could be subsidies towards that as well. But the idea being that all of these assets, we look to build early stage, we have um, uh, we have the assets cross collateralized, meaning that if one falls over, we can offset the costs of investment into that with the uh, developers to set it off against another asset coming through. What we're looking to do here is build an ongoing basis where we have several assets coming through to, uh, to get planning consent every year. And then we'll be taking a view on which we take forward through this process, maybe sell earlier stage, maybe sell later stage, but to recycle that capital back into the business. Um, there's an argument to say we could sell the rest if we have more Spanish projects coming through, we could sell the rest of the Walker uh, portfolio at some point as well. So it just gives you an investor a bit of an idea of the strategy that we're looking to progress on this. Okay. Um, there's important considerations in the regulatory environment as well, but uh, Toby will just talk through it at the moment. Cool. Sure thing. Uh, so <laughs> we note that this slide is uh, already out of date as on the uh, data publication, um, the second uh, round consultation from the uh, REMA, Review of Electricity Market Arrangements, was released. Um, and we have, of course, been digesting that um, over the coming days and we'll be responding to that consultation and giving a view in due course. At a high level, um, we're, we're pleased to see that they are uh, the direction of travel is away from some of the more revolutionary um, uh, aspects that, uh, and initiatives that were being initially consulted on. Um, within the scope of uh, consultation, there remains regional pricing and um, a national pricing model. Um, and it also looks like they're moving away from disaggregating the market, meaning that renewable generators such as solar farms will retain exposure to the marginal price setter, um, which will remain gassed um, in the near term future. Um, we will, of course, continue to monitor progress on REMA um, as a key initiative of the UK electricity markets. There's been no further um, feedback from the uh, consultation into the transition to fixed price certificates um, that uh, Desnes uh, launched last year. Um, so we await that along with the rest of the market um, and trust that the government will hopefully see sense um, in not uh, making uh, dramatic changes to the subsidy regime in order to continue to support best confidence in the market. In Spain, uh, there has been a reintroduction of generation tax. However, this, uh, the impact of this has been offset um, by the fact that the uh, windfall tax, um, uh, the clawback tax, has not been continued into 2024. And there has also been a reduction in the bono social, uh, which are actually community benefit contributions uh, that projects make. Um, so the overall impact of regulatory changes in Spain has been somewhat muted. Uh, can move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, and just to, just to summarise everything, like we're, we're, it's been record electricity generation for the fund for the year um, and very strong good operational performance in the UK and Spain, not without some issues there in Australia that we're looking to uh, rectify those as soon as possible and deal with them. The uh, strongest ever cash generation from the assets um, delivering 120 million in the last year due to the strong price fixes we've had in place. On a Lincoln, we are upping the dividend, but we are also targeting more of a 
a, a high yielding income plus growth strategy here, long term growth being brought through by the development pipeline as well, and looking at strong cash generation for the for the coming years to support that as well. So the growth, really, the acquisition of those rights in the first development stage project is just the beginning of that. And we're targeting two to three gigawatts in what we see as the engine room to drive the fund forward. We, we know that the markets will be continued to, will continue to be challenging probably for the rest of this year, at least until we're getting towards some significant rate cuts. Um, we're going to do everything we can to position the fund in the best place possible to take advantage of the situation when markets turn. Um, we will continue with our capital, um, I think, disciplined capital allocation between ourselves and the board that we are uh, we are all in line with and agreed upon and think that the opportunity is still there. Once markets turn, once there is a clear reduction in interest rates, we do not think they're going to go down to clearly... We see them moderating back over the next couple of years, not going back to the levels we saw of the last decade. And that's why it's important to give a good spread there in terms of yield versus other alternatives in terms of fixed income and other bank. And the fact that it will continue to be a growing dividend. It will continue to have the ability for long term now growth in the portfolio as well, we see as being an attractive alternative. But we'll pause there. I see there's quite a few questions and maybe we can try and get through as, as many of those as possible. Yeah, yep, perfect. Ross, Toby, thank you very much for your presentation. We do have another poll which will appear on your screens now. And if you could respond to that, the company would be most grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments for those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you did mention, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. So at this point, Matthias, if I can hand over to you just to chair the Q&A, that'd be great. And then I'll pick up from you at the end. And we'll see if we can run down our list. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think there are quite a few questions about debt structure and yeah. cost. So I think yeah. if you could address some of those from the start, maybe we can then pick off some of the, the more broad ones. Yeah, so the, the cost of the long-term debt, we know this one is, is 4.15% all in. It's all fully hedged out as well. Um, so we don't have, we, we continually keep kicking the tires on that to see if there's other options to, uh, but it's fully amortized and fully paying down. We would look at that if we saw there being a, a benefit from uh, breaking hedges. Uh, at the moment, we don't quite see that, but there might be a sweet spot at some point, something we continue to look at. Um, total death and RCF moving to over the next one to two years. Good question. Our, our target with investments is to substantially pay the RCF off over the next year or so. I think it would be a good question of where things sort of sit in capacity by the time we need to refi that facility in a couple of years' time, and whether we need as much as, uh, as we do currently have. So we will, we will continue to look at that. Um, I think that was mostly on, on debt. I think there are a couple of questions on BEZ as well, in terms of what, what is the plan for BEZ. For yeah, yeah, and then there was also one about co-location for co BEZ. So okay. if you can cover both of those. I'll pick up those, both those questions separately. Um, so I guess there's, there's no shying away from the fact that 2023 was a bad year for batteries um, in terms of revenue performance uh, with uh, batteries across the country. Um, seeing substantially below uh, lower levels of revenue than forecast um, one or two years ago. Um, this is a confluence of a number of factors um, that all were headwinds to revenues in the sector, some of which are well documented and some of which um, are less, less well talked about and understood. Um, just to summarise briefly, um, power prices softened throughout the period and in absolute, uh, with lower absolute power prices there was less volatility uh, for batteries to trade within. Um, that was a combination of uh, demand destruction as the cost of living prices fit and businesses and households uh, consume less energy. Um, it was also a low wind year, uh, so there was uh, less periods where wind uh, caused very low pricing uh, through overproduction. Um, so again, contributing to that reduced volatility. Um, during the tightest points in the period, uh, the introduction of the demand flexibility services uh, for the first time uh, dampened the very extreme pricing. Um, in the first year, we feel that that was oversubscribed relative to how it performed going forwards due to the pricing set by the regulator there. Um, and then finally, I come on to the acceptance rates for batteries, um, or more affectionately known as skip rates in the industry, where batteries have been uh, overlooked in um, 
um, just have the balancing mechanism to the tune of 85 to 90 percent. Um, this is a data issue uh, that the uh, control room uh, at the ESO need to resolve, um, where they need to understand what the state of charge is of batteries over the network, so they can be more effectively dispatched in the balancing market going forward. So a number of headwinds all coincided to drive very poor battery performance in 2023. There is some cause for optimism um, as some of those issues are addressed, and hopefully there won't be coincidence of those issues going forwards, um, noting that coincidence of bad weather and, and those market and structural factors. Um, I think that, so our view is that there will can probably continue to be a slightly rocky revenue outlook for the near term, um, as we expect that there may be a degree of overbuild given the number of batteries that the battery is looking to connect um, in the immediate future. Um, we will be looking with interest at the performance of our first battery that comes online later this year. I guess we will just then go on to say that we are currently causing um, material capital investments into progressing our two pre-construction battery projects. Uh, and that is a view that's aligned with our co-shareholder, uh, JLEN, uh, also under the management of Foresight Group. Um, those assets are very well protected in terms of their project rights. Um, and so we are you know, evaluating the best course of action uh, to progress those projects and realize best value for shareholders going forwards. Um, just touching on the co-location point, I saw the question um, uh, earlier on in the presentation around does it make sense to connect um, batteries to all solar projects? Um, the, the business case for co-location is, is a viable one, um, albeit I think uh, our analysis demonstrates it only makes it do so at scale. Um, so we would see you know, large batteries being connected to large solar points, uh, projects as being most beneficial. Um, it is not uh, necessarily straightforward to retrofit um, to existing solar pro projects um, due to constraints in uh, the configuration of the grid connection. Um, and so we would see the, uh, the most profitable um, strategy for pursuing co-location in new build sites where the system is designed um, uh, you know, from, stay, from day one uh, to be co-located, allowing you to take full benefit um, of the, uh, the efficiencies that could be gained there. Yeah, I guess the only thing we'd add to that is if there is we don't have the scope for it on some of our existing sites. They're quite modest size batteries. It's more of an asset management initiative than anything that's going to turn the dial in the in the valuations. Um, there's yeah. a couple of other questions on the toast. Do you want to just yeah. those? Um, I think falling power prices affecting NAB and revenues this year. Yeah, fair question. I think it comes to some of that we've been talking about. I think because of the it's fair to say that the power curves that most of us rely on in the market and a blend of, uh, we use the brand of three consultants, are lagging the, uh, the fall in the forward rates a bit at the moment. Um, and where those are are slightly below the curves. All I'd say is that we are very well hedged for the next couple of years. We've looked at this um, and actually a, a drop in the merchant element isn't going to have a significant impact. There may be a bit of downside there but it doesn't look significant because of the hedges that we've got. And then you're getting, you're quite quickly getting down to that sort of 60 pound per megawatt hour in the forecast by about 26 uh, and onwards. So not a, not a material. We don't foresee any of the big drops uh, that we've sort of seen throughout the last year as those uh, prices moderate back down. And, and just to the, the latest question that we received around sustainability of dividend cover, um, this is something that we, we look at very carefully when uh, deciding our dividend policy going forwards. Um, we aim to deliver a progressive dividend um, you know, every year growing um, that, that dividend, um, as we have done every year since uh, IPO. Um, and part of the consideration for any increase in any individual year is the outlook of dividend cover going forward. And a significant part of that is the power price outlook. So we very carefully as a management team um, with our investment committees and then with our board, look at the power price outlook, what we're able to lock into in terms of uh, fixed price hedges, um, and then always targeting robust dividend cover in the years ahead. And so we are very confident um, uh, in our opinion that the dividend will remain well covered um, in the years ahead as we continue to grow it on a um, progressive basis. And just the, I'm seeing a couple of other questions there, noted one, there was one question about uh, holdings of our directors in the um, in the company if you look on it's all there disclosed on page 114 of the accounts another question there about the um, impact of irradiation changes across future forecasts um, there's also included in the report in the sustainability section we've run some analysis on this with consultants to what uh, the increase in temperatures could mean for the portfolio it's still admittedly still a little bit at the sort of theoretical level but um, effectively what it's sort of saying is 
actually as uh, as temperatures increase if they do increase sort of slightly it actually becomes more beneficial to the portfolio i think what you start to see is sort of drier spells in the sort of um, places such as the uk which will probably have higher irradiation but you would then as, as temperatures continue to increase if we get to that more than one and a half two and a half percent or beyond that then you start uh, suffering uh, solar stops suffering from extreme heat in certain areas and that's particularly in places such as southern spain or australia where there's more risk to us so it's a bit of a balanced picture in terms of that um so i think what we're all keen to make sure is that uh, we are working towards limiting climate change in general um to that but there's a there's analysis on that within the annual report as well so do you want to pick a few um, more yeah, there's there's one more i just spot there which is just around that the returns that the disposal of the um law asset represents um, so yeah, we, we mentioned it was a 21% um, uh, premium to holding value, uh, that, uh, that sale value. Um, overall, that's a, a, in excess of a 12% IRR that was uh, generated um, on the investment um, in that 50% holding of the law for assets. Um, we think that that was a, you know, a great result uh, uh, and you know, highly appreciative uh, to the fund's investment targets. What we would say is that that was um, acquiring an asset um, and taking it from immediately pre-construction um, we hope to go better than that as we look to invest in development stage projects, um, uh, taking them through from an earlier stage, something that Foresight Group as a house has been doing for a number of years in its unlisted strategies, and now um, our listed solar fund um, is you know, going to benefit from that experience and track record. Yeah. Um, see a question that's highlighted there about colour on possibilities of MA in the solar or renewable space. I think it's fair to say like, it's something that the house is looking at. Uh, from various different angles, we're considering this. For those of you who know the REIT sector, um, yes, it feels like the renewables and our sector here is, is dragging or uh, lagging behind what's going on in the REIT space. There is every opportunity, I think, for some consolidation in this market, and it's something that we're thinking about very, very closely through different, uh, different means as well, I think. Just want to say that you've only seen one sort of approach for one of the smaller funds at the moment. I think we've covered most of them. Um, I'll have a detailed look through, and if there are any other ones remaining, I can we can just enter those via text as well. So let's wrap it up there. Perfect. Thank you very much for answering all those questions from investors. And of course, the company can review all questions submitted today, as Mateus just pointed out, and we'll publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company. Ross, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yes, yeah, certainly. Look, it's um, definitely the, the market and the, the current uh, macro, macroeconomic and uh, backdrop at the moment remains challenging. We don't think that's necessarily going to turn quickly. Um, what, we, what we are doing is positioning the fund to be as uh, self-reliant as possible in not requiring the need to get out there for capital raises at the moment because we can't. Uh, so what we're looking to do is recycle capital. I think the main message we want to get across today is even when things do eventually turn, but we expect could be a bit more positive news by later this year or next, it won't go back to being business as usual. And that's why we're looking at this as more of a trading strategy for the fund, going through making more divestments and recycling of capital, and really looking at now more of a total return strategy in terms of very strong growth, uh, very strong yield for the company, along with long-term growth that we hope to drive through that development pipeline as well. So that's the, that's the key message we want to leave for investors today. Perfect. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team Foresight Solar Fund Limited, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all. Thank, thank you all. Thank you very much.